Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas and Caballeros. Welcome back to another edition of Leave It in the Ring. I'm your host, Dave Duenas, with my co-host, Gable Montoya, and the man behind the switchboard, Mr. David Chen. We got a great show tonight here on Leave It in the Ring. You know, we got Kevin Ioli from Yahoo Sports, we got Steve Kim from Max Boxing, and we got Dougie Fisher from Ring Magazine or Ring TV, wherever which one you want to put them under. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different here on Leave It in the Ring. Me and Gable wanted to bring on some sports writers, some boxing writers here, and to discuss the beginning of the internet. Tell us a little bit about how they got involved getting this whole business picked up. I'm back with Kevin Ioli of Yahoo Sports, uh, formerly of the uh, Las Vegas paper, uh, and is a boxing writer for how many years now, Kevin? I guess it's getting oh, over 25 and less than 30, somewhere in between there. Wow. Woo, oh, long welcome time. to the show, Kevin. I'm here with <laughs> David Duenas, uh, my partner. You, you know very well. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Hey, Dave. Hey, how you doing, Kevin? A couple of things we wanted to cover. We can get to the other part later. Uh, so we're going to have Doug and Steve on uh, later on tonight. And one of the themes is just kind of uh, how Internet reporting has changed over the years. But th- we were talking about the Internet earlier. That's kind of the theme of our show. Um, and I'm curious. I mean, you were, you were with the, the Las Vegas uh, Review uh, for years and years. And then you switched over from newspaper to Yahoo. I think we talked a little bit about this before, but... Just curious of your earliest memories and, and what your thoughts were when you switched over to the Internet. Was it a matter of kind of jumping off a sinking ship? Uh, did you see it as a greater opportunity to, to reach a, a wider audience? What was it? Or do you well, even take it serious when they, when they offered that to you in the beginning? Oh, no, no. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. But I, I, I'll talk about Yahoo in a second. But let me, let me first say this. You know, I, I am a, a great technology guy, and I've been interested. You know, that's one of my passions in life. And I worked at Apple just because I love technology, and I like to be around it. And I, so I had two jobs just so I could be around it for as long as I could do that. Um, wow. So I, I was on the Internet in 1990. You know, I had, I had computers in 1985, you know, when, when they were just starting out. Uh-oh. When they were just little green screens, <laughs> the green lettering. <laughs> they were little green screens for a long time. But so, you know, so I've always been a guy in technology, and I remember uh, when we first moved to Nevada, and and I had Prodigy Internet service, and just to see some full wow. screen graphics, you know, it was hilarious and just really a lot of fun. So I, I actually wrote some for Max Boxing starting in the early 2000s, uh, and got on Doug Fisher uh, and Gary Randall had called me, and I got a chance to do that and, and really enjoyed it. it. Was writing a weekly column for a while there. So you know, I, I think there's a lot of good things out there on the internet, and 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 the internet is a great place for whatever your hobby, it, no matter what it is. And our passion is boxing. You can find a ton of information out there about it. When Yahoo approached me, it was a little different. You know, I had been at the Review Journal for a long time. You know, Yahoo had clearly made a difference. It was not like a sports-specific website like, a, you know, like a Max Boxing or a Boxing Scene or Fight News or any of those. You know, this was a general sports website. So general sports websites have different priorities than sports-specific websites. Secondarily, you know, they they were doing this a different way. You know, they wanted to compete against ESPN, and we have more than competed with them. You know, we are the number one site, sports site in the world, and we have been, I think, if I'm not mistaken now, it's 54 the last 55 months um, that we've been, we've been number one. And normally we're number one by a wide margin. Wow. And, so, so that's it's a little, and they were bringing in some of the greatest writers, you know, in the in the world, and hiring them and paying very well. So, yeah, when they called me, I was like, yeah, no doubt, I'm there. And uh, you know, so I'm able to cover fights that I would have never been able to cover at the Review Journal. But the great thing about the internet is, I think, you know, is exemplified by the story I did yesterday on Bob Arum and his son, going and talking about what happened in El Paso. Bob Arum's son wrote a book. He is a professor of sociology and education, and he wrote a book criticizing colleges for the lack of learning by the students. The, the fight got canceled 
at least in El Paso, between Chavez and Andy Lee because mm -hmm. the Chancellor of the University of Texas system said, hey, you know what, there's some security concerns here. And even though the, even the FBI said we don't know what these security concerns are, the guy cancels the fight. Well, it turns out, you know what, this guy, Richard Aram, was quoted in the Washington Post and in the New York Times and several other publications being critical of the University of Texas's progress in this. And so there's this, you know, it's not proven, but there is evidence that, in fact, uh, the chancellor had uh, retribution and was going after Aram for comments his son made. To me, just, you know, phenomenal. And the Internet was so critical to that because I could see all the different p stories people had written, and there was a statement from a, a U.S. representative on one site. And I could link to all that, do my interview with Bob Aram and Richard Aram, and point and put put all the dots together that the internet gives you in, in a newspaper. If the internet wasn't there, that story would have been, if not impossible to do, it certainly would have been less impossible to do in one day. Like like I had had done it, I would have had to see all the physical papers, and there's there was a big problem. So I think that that you know really exemplifies what the internet can be. Right. I as a writer for me, I mean, I, I would have never been a writer if it wasn't for the internet. You know, I, I started on a forum on doghouse boxing, and and you know now I, here I am six seven years later interviewing you. It's it's been very it's a tool like that you say that, that you say something and it's always going to be out there on the internet. But also just writing a story, you pull up box rec, you check the record, you pull up fight facts, you check the record, you do all these other you know these little research things that might have taken you forever before, and they're just right there at the you know you click Control T, you pull up a tab, and you open your new site and you check it. It, it has really changed, and, and it, even going back to the social media thing that you were talking about before, that we can all interact in a way that, is, that just didn't exist before. What do you think are some of the things we've lost, though, because of this? Well, you know, here, and, and, and I always get criticized when I say this, and, and I mean this. I get hundreds of people asking me on social media, I want to be a journalist. Can you help me to be a journalist? I want to learn. I want to do this. And <laughs> anybody that's really serious that wants to be a journalist, I go out of my way to help them. I critique their work. I talk to them. I do as much as I can do to help them because I've, I've had wonderful breaks in my career. I'm in a wonderful position now that I thank God for every day that I have. And I want to see other people be as fortunate as me, and I want to give back to, to my uh, my profession. That said, a lot of times what happens with the Internet is there are some people who aren't trained who get, a we get on a website, some big website, some small website, and they write things, and they don't follow professional standards. And so they say they heard this is happening or they heard that's happening, and there's nothing to back up what they say. They don't source their information. They don't double-check right. things. And that is the problem. So as great as the Internet is, it's dangerous in that regard when you give somebody power that really they can reach every single person in the world. And that's enormous, enormous power. And that, there have to be checks and balances. And that's one of the things that, that I have a concern about as a professional journalist. I would rather miss a story and not get the story up just because I knew I couldn't be 100% certain that it was right, then to write something and be first with it and, and be sweating to see, am I accurate? Is this correct? Did I get it right? So, yeah. you know, that's the thing that I think is the, is the scary thing. There's a lot of really talented writers, you know, including you, Gabe, that I think are out there that are doing wonderful work and are and taking on great causes, you know, like the PED things that we talked about before. The thing that we have to be wary of is some of the ones that are just basically rumor mongers and they're guys that, hey, everybody's entitled to their opinion, so you know what, my next-door neighbor, if he wants to sit there and start blogging and write about you know, boxing and, and um, Kevin Ioli's crazy and doesn't know what he's talking about, God bless him, you, you should be able to do that. But that <laughs> right. person cannot be considered a journalist right. the same way that you and I are. There's a big, big difference. You really have to hold yourself to a high standard. I, mean, I was lucky to to get on press row and kind of meet Doug and Steve and, and meet you eventually and, and all the other guys, Robert Morales, David Avila. But meeting those guys, it was like, all right, here's the standard. And you better be able to, if you want to sit next to those guys and be able to talk to them, they're eventually going to read your work. It better be good. You know, and I, I think there's generations and like, 
Well, yeah, even like even print, what's that? Even even like you know like when I met all these all these guys too, you know, you I think it, you have to have a sense of you need to know it, it, that you're not on that level. Like you know, when I met Dougie and I, didn't, I met Steve and I met when I met you, Gabe, when I met Kevin, I I automatically understood that this is a different league. These these are these guys are real journalists and these guys are really covering the sport. I could tell the difference with, from a from a guy that blogs from a guy that really does the research. I think though uh, when I do speak to other other journalists that are really they do their job and they do the follow ups and they do the investigations and research that they it cringes their art because of guys that are able to get in the press that don't have uh, the background to it. I mean, Kevin, do you sometimes think that this needs to be regulated? I mean, like other sports, not just anybody can pick up a pen and paper and go to a press conference. See, I think it's great that everybody has the ability to go to WordPress or blogger.com and create a blog and write their opinion. That That is what is so wonderful about the Internet. And there's some people that have done it and have become – you know, big uh, superstar journalists and done great things, and there's going to be more to do it. But that's their, the percentage of people that do that is low, and I, I am all for democracy in action, and that's, that's actually democracy, being able to express your opinion on whatever the topic that you're interested in. But what, what, there have to be standards when you're being a professional journalist. When you're going out to be at press row, you can't be out there cheering. You can't be out there high-fiving the fighters. You can't be out right. there taking. And this is another thing. There's people who take things, and they, they accept, if not money, and I think in some cases money, but if they, if they accept some value from the people that, that they are covering, and you can't, you can't be friends with the fighters, and I can't tell you how much I, I've argued with so many people. There's somebody right. in MMA, I won't mention the name, but that I had a huge argument with because, oh, we can be friends with the fighters. No, you can't. You, you can be friendly with them. You can have a courteous professional relationship, and you can get along well in a professional relationship, but to be a friend and to go drinking with and to hang out with and to invite to your home on Thanksgiving, you cannot have that kind of relationship. And I think a right. lot of people who haven't been professionally trained don't understand that difference. Oh, yeah. You'll learn I that agree. lesson if you have, and I certainly did. Uh, well, Kevin, uh, I know it's you're up against it. you got to go. Man, enlightening and fun as always. I, I really thank you for coming on the show. Always just, fun. Always fun when yeah. you come on. I appreciate I love it. You know, I love talking boxing. Anytime you guys want me, I'm happy to do it. Thanks so much. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Kevin. We appreciate it. Kevin Ioli from Yahoo Sports with us. Not only covers boxing, but MMA. Uh, a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting things here. He said on on leaving the ring. We got a good show here for everybody that's listening, tuning in on leaving the ring every Thursday night, five o'clock p.m. Uh, Pacific time, eight o'clock Eastern time. We got uh, we have Kevin Ioli from Yahoo Sports to come on and speak to us about his uh, transition from paper to internet, but also talked a little bit about other things among boxing and MMA. MMA. Uh, but we got Dougie Fisher from Ring, and we got Steve Steve Kim from Max Boxing going to come on here and speak to us here on Leaving the Ring. I'm excited to have these guys on. It's it's kind of cool. These are, I was saying to Kevin, there's, there's generations here. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be three different generations on this show. Uh, we Actually, four now. We had the, the, the print guy that went to internet, we have the the internet guys that you know Doug was a guy that was college you know uh, educated journalist came out started his own website along with Steve uh, who joined later uh, and those are the pioneers of the internet age uh, I'm kind of that next generation that grew up in the forums of those websites and then became a writer and Dave is, is that next generation the YouTube generation which is probably the most explosive and fastest growing of all the generations um, so it's it's kind of interesting uh, just looking at this whole timeline. But I'm far from yeah, a journalist. <laughs> well, you're in the sense of video journalist, though, going in there and interviewing Freddie. Those were good interviews. That's how I first got to know you. And, and right. it's a different thing. I mean, it's, it's you know, the YouTube is, man, when I, I didn't really even know that community existed until I met you. And it was brutal, man. I thought message boards were tough. Sweet yeah. Lord. The comment sections underneath some of those videos, you know, make the I've had what. some... I've had some great times on on YouTube. You know, where, uh, you know, the boxing community on YouTube was was really small at the time. There was only probably about seven of us out there that were doing uh, YouTube videos and debating and doing predictions. 
and uh, we used to have some really good debates, man. Go back and forth, you know, uh, 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 you know, with each other about particular fights that were coming up or issues in boxing, and then um, we kind of knew that uh, uh, it was going to pick up. I mean, you know, by other people that are watching it. I think though. To me, now, you know, uh, there are still a lot of great guys on YouTube, but now you kind of more or less now see fanboys that are doing YouTube uh, videos, you know, more or less like Manny Pacquiao fans and Floyd Mayweather fans where they do 20 videos about their fighter a day, you know. And I think if those right. – when we talk about unprofessionalism, what Kevin Ioli was saying, you know, guy jumping up and applauding for, for a fighter, you imagine if you gave those guys credentials. <laughs> Nothing that covered. Be- yeah, it doesn't cover just a lot of, but I got a ton of autographs and photos taken. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we're welcome to the show. Um, I'm not sure what your official title is, Doug. Uh, the the editor of Ring TV magazine, uh, but formerly, you know, one of the, uh, or is it Ring TV? You have to tell Ring, me, Doug. RingTV.com. Yeah, uh, or, or, I'm the editor of RingTV.com, and I think my, my title uh, for the magazine, although I do very little with the magazine, um, uh, it's mostly that. That's Michael Rosenthal's show. He's the editor in chief of the magazine, and I'm the uh, associate editor of the magazine. So my or, main or sh- thing is, 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 you know, running the website basically. Right, right. Or should we just call you by what everybody else knows you by, the man with the ponytail? Yeah, <laughs> we do that. Yeah. How you doing, <laughs> Doug? The ambiguous dude with the glasses and the ponytail. Yeah, that that works. It's all good. <laughs> Sometimes they call me that. They're like, Yeah, yeah I know. You, you you stole my act. <laughs> I, okay, yeah. it's kind of like I was I was at a fight for the World Series of Boxing and uh one of the announcers, his wife was there and she was talking to me like she knew me. I had never seen this woman. And she walked away and I went, Holy shit, she thought I was Doug. Because I was wearing awesome. my glasses that night. It was pretty that's funny. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's, that's flattering to me. She said, like, you got a haircut. I was like, Actually I just did, yeah. Because <laughs> really I had just gotten a haircut. <laughs> One of the things we're talking about tonight, uh, besides the fights, is uh, kind of our theme is, is, is uh, the beginnings of Internet journalism. Uh, and you, in my opinion, uh, we've talked about this in the story I'm writing, uh, are one of the pioneers uh, of this. I know there's Cyber Boxing Zone, and, uh, but there was, there was House of Boxing, which is pretty much the first, kind of the template for every website that came after it. Uh, yeah, maybe. There were, there were websites before House of Boxing, though. I, mean, I remember there was a website called Fighters.com. Mm. Um, there was cyber boxing zone, definitely. Uh, there was some others. I mean, there were and there were just certain like fan sites or um, you know sites that were sort of dedicated to certain boxers, like HarryGreb.com. Right. Those all predate um, House of Boxing. I think House of Boxing went online in December of '97. Mm. Um, so it's it's definitely one of the first um, boxing websites. But it, it I think it, it yeah maybe you could say it's a template for you know, sort of the boxing news slash online magazine. And it was also the fir- one of the first, maybe it was the first, I don't know for sure, but one of the first to really be, to to really try to be multimedia, to sort of take advantage of the multimedia aspects of what was then new media, you know, the Internet, um, and have audio content and video content. I mean, that was, that was important to House of Boxing. And, of course, House of Boxing turned into Max Boxing in, uh, I think it was March of 2001. I think that's what Gary Randall said to me because uh, I interviewed him also for this story. And he was when you're right. part. And, of and it, it should be noted he was yeah he was the co he was the co-creator, um, co-producer, whatever, co-founder of of House of Boxing. It was Gary Randall and I. I wouldn't have tried to do it without somebody. You know, I I, I needed a partner who was uh, on the the internet side, the the graphic design, uh, and the technical side, and I was just the uh, the journalist side. Dougie, you know, when you after getting out of school and everything, what 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 was why was the decision of of going into the internet? I mean, did you was it because you felt like the that paper and yeah. stuff not giving any dedication to boxing? Well, yeah, but I had no intentions of getting involved with the internet. I'm 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 the antithesis of Kevin Ioli. I don't care for technology. I mean, I, people had to force me to get a cell phone. People are going to they haven't succeeded yet, but people are going to eventually force me to get a smartphone. Um, I knew, you know, I knew about the internet, um, you know, go, as I think probably as early as like ninety two, ninety three, um, but I, I had no interest in it. And um, with me, with getting involved with boxing, I've always been a boxing fan, 
but getting involved with boxing, wanting to be a boxing writer and um, doing it through the Internet, um, it, it, it's all about location. I moved from the East Coast to, to Los Angeles, and once in Los Angeles, I'm in this hotbed for boxing. I'm seeing mm-hmm. boxing and, and stuff that I used to watch uh, on what was then the Prime Network, which is now uh, Fox Sports Net. You know, I used to watch foreign boxing shows at like 3 o'clock in the morning when I was in you know, the Midwest in Ohio and Missouri. And I was like, finally, I can go and see these fights. So I went to forum shows, and I was watching Chiquita Gonzalez and Mark Tusharp Johnson, and I was going uh-huh. to shows in the Valley, and I was watching Shane Mosley fight when he was 13-0, and 14-0, and 15-0. And and so I was, I was, you know, and I was going, even the, um, the Olympic um, reopened in the mid to late 90s, or during, yeah, during the, the, the second half of the 90s. And I was going to monthly shows that Top Rank was putting on there. And so, and this is just as a fan, I'm buying tickets, you know. Right. But I'm I'm suddenly immersed in this boxing culture, and um, I think I was one of the first people to sign up uh, to join the, the L.A. Boxing Club, which was in downtown Los Angeles. It was sort of adjacent to the Olympic. And I'm suddenly I'm training around these guys who I saw fight, like uh, the, the late Chicanito Hernandez and, and, and Shane Mosley. And I'm not seeing anything written about it in the newspapers. At that time, the L.A. Times... Um, and the L.A. Daily News, boxing was Oscar De La Hoya. And right. There was a little bit of attention given to, you know, mostly top-ranked shows um, it, with with Michael Rosenthal, who was the boxing writer of um, the, the the Daily News. He would also, he covered folks who were from that area. I mean, the Dan Goosen's fighters, um, the Rayless brothers, and Michael Nunn. He, he followed them because, you know, Goosen was, you know, kind of a local promoter for the for the Valley area. But really, outside of that little bubble, there wasn't. There was no love given to to the forum. There really mm. wasn't. There was no love given to, you know, uh, you know, Juan Manuel Marquez when he was a prospect or when he was a bona fide number one contender who couldn't get a shot at Prince Nassim Hamed. You know, so I saw that, and there was an opportunity because I, I got to know Gary Randall, who was a, a, a web designer, a webmaster. Um, who trained. He trained with the same guy who was training me, Kevin Morgan. And we became friends. We sparred together and stuff. And, and um, he told me that he had he, he had tried to put out some boxing websites, and he told me that the network shut him down. And I'm like, that's crazy. I, I'd like to see him. He's like, I, well, he said, they're offline, but come by my place and I'll show you. And he, he showed me something called firedevil.com or firedevil.net. That was his name for a boxing website. <laughs> um, but it was it was just basically like it was video clips taken uh-huh. from like uh, the Tyson Holyfield fight and little GIF animations that he you know clipped out from that video, and he didn't understand that you know the network saw that as you know copyright infringement you know, oh, and right. so yeah I think Showtime sent him serious letters like you better cease and desist you know, and I told him well you know if we cover this as media if we're credentialed if we can get credentialed as media. That content that we produce, we own it. Now, we can't show fights, but we can show everything else right. around the fight. And we can certainly write about it and, and, and take pictures. And, and that's really how it started, and it was really a labor of love. for Dougie, tell us a little bit. How, how difficult, though, was it? I mean, here you are, Internet, and, and promoters, I mean, the, the, the publicists don't really know a whole lot about it. How long and how difficult was it for them to give you credentials and to really take you guys serious? Really? It wasn't hard at all. Now, taking us seriously? <laughs> right. Yeah, that, may be, that, that probably took a few years. But getting the credentials, we started local. Remember, I told you, the, 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 right. the, the local promotions were getting no love from the newspapers. And even, you know, even big shots like Aaron. Aaron was king, you know, particularly in the West Coast at this time. He was doing shows with, you know, some guy named Floyd Mayweather as a prospect, you know, fighting every month at the Olympic. Um, and he couldn't get any love for, for Mayweather. He couldn't get any love for Diego Corrales. He couldn't get any love for Lehman Brewster. He couldn't get any love for Antonio Diaz. All these guys were coming up as nobodies. You know, these guys had like a couple of fights, and they were fighting. And so they were, you know, we're saying, hey, we're going to cover these guys. We're gonna t- we care. I'm, I'm, I was a hardcore fan, so, of course, I cared about these guys. And um, so they were happy. Lee Samuels was happy to give me a credential to those monthly top-ranked shows. And uh, it was John Beirutti who was the PR guy with the forum. And then after Beirutti, it was, uh, uh, I forget the guy's name. His last name was Steiner. He just didn't care. I mean, he was like, you want to cover uh-huh. this stuff? Go for it. 
No one else cares, you know what I mean? So it was like it was like That's funny. Gary and I were the only English speaking media covering those forum shows and shoot, they did like two or three shows a month. But it was all you know, it was Latino, it was Mexican and, and you know, folks from South America and the Caribbean. And um that's how you know, I kinda cut my teeth covering those local shows until we got big enough to where, you know, we started covering the bigger fight. I think the first major fight that we covered in Vegas was uh Mike Tyson's comeback after his year suspension from the ear bite, uh from biting Holyfield's ear in ninety seven. Right. It was yeah. uh it was uh Francois Botham. So that's the first big Vegas fight that Gary and I covered uh under um House of Boxing. And well, right you know, hand, it really was. just kind of snowballed, you know, but it wasn't hard breaking in. Maybe it would have been a different story on the East Coast, you know, that can be a little tougher on stuff, but I mean there's a certain spirit out here, you know, the, you know, sort of an entrepreneurial spirit, um, you know, Hollywood spirit if you will, um out in this area in Southern California and they either didn't care or, you know, they didn't care to where they didn't want to block us, you know, or they were happy. Like like Lee Samuels was happy that I was there at a press conference interviewing Diego Corrales. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, you, you, finally someone's going to get this guy some attention, you know? Right, right. Please. And it just, you know, it got, it just and it took off really quickly. I mean, like before, I mean, by 99 there were companies that were, and this was during the whole dot-com boom, you know, before the dot bomb, you know, but right. you know, there were there were venture capitalists out there looking to attain um online properties. And, you know, sports was of course, you know, a a popular subject and um you know, before we settled on um this crazy manager from, from the New York, New Jersey area, Mark Roberts, who had some company called uh Worldwide Entertainment and Sports, they bought House of Boxing and, and that's when I really became a full time boxing writer and that was late ninety nine, early two thousand. But there were other companies, like companies from Europe and companies. There was a company out of Canada that was looking to to purchase the website and hire us um, as like full time employees, which was very exciting. That was a very exciting time. Sounds like it was an exciting time, man. I mean, yeah, it is, yeah. Gee. Now, now everybody and their brother is trying to do that. And it, it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the market. Hey, and that's another thing. The market was not as crowded. As it is now, and I think it's great that the market's crowded, and it's, you know, it's, I mean, after House of Boxing, Fight News popped up, and Fight News is still around and, and, and doing its thing, and there were other websites that, 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 that popped up after House of Boxing. Like I said, House of Boxing became um, Max Boxing, and, you know, I think, you know, Internet journalism really took off, and I think that that whole decade, 2000 to 2010, I think if you want to break it up, like, like, uh, Gabe was talking about generations of boxing writers. Well, you could you can break the sport of boxing up, um, uh, categorizing it by the medium that covers it. I mean, you got the newspaper age, and then you mm-hmm. have like the radio age. There was a time where everyone followed boxing. Everyone was listening to Joe Lewis fight on the radio the entire right. time. Right. Everything yeah. stopped. You're gonna listen to Joe Lewis fight Max Schmeling on the radio, and then there's the TV age, which just exploded and lasted for decades, and then the cable TV age, and then, you know, cable TV, was that, that was that was the 90s, and then, you know, the 2000s was the internet age, and now we're in a new age, which is the social media age, because the internet is no longer new media, it is just media, it's just, right. it's just another sure. medium, you know? And um, it's another medium for entertainment and, and information, and, and social media is sort of like the new wave. And I and all I, admit, I feel old, man. I'm like I'm slow with this, stuff. like tweeting and you know dealing, you know, with Facebook and doing all that stuff. I'm 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 not I'm not up on it. I'm not. A tell tell me about it. I can text fact. you. I can literally text you something. It takes you like an hour just to text back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of weird that, it, that, that as expansive <laughs> as the media is now, the internet and social media, it's like we we can reach as far as we ever could, and yet our sport is actually in popularity has diminished with yeah. the greater the technology we've got. Right. I mean, well, because the people the people who are involved in the media, the online media and the social media are they're they've already they're they're converted. It's it's the converted it, it, it are preaching to the converted. You know what I mean? It's like we're all, yeah. it's all it's it's a hardcore community and it's strong. So it's like I don't think boxing's ever going to die, but something does need to happen in order for boxing to grow because it's not bringing in the casual and the curious, which I think 
it was doing that for a long time, mainly th- you know going back to the TV age when it was on network TV. You could it just you know you could just happen to be flipping through channels on a Sunday afternoon and see a title fight, see like a really good title fight, not like BS, like Marvin Hagler fight. You know what I mean? Right. You know you could have happened across that and then be suddenly oh man I'm a Hagler fan or I'm, you know or whatever this is this boxing's awesome. You could you could have happened across. Um, a David, uh, I'm sorry, not David, but a, a little Red Lopez fight, right. and been like, "Wow, this is crazy, this is amazing," and gotten hooked like that. And even, I, you know, I wasn't a hardcore fan during that period. You know, during the, the the early '80s and the '80s, I became a hardcore fan actually in the late '80s and the early '90s when it was it was actually the cable age and pay per view was just getting started with with TV KO, but it was still boxing was still being it was still Shown on network television on Saturday afternoons, yeah. um, Tuesday sometimes nights. on Friday or Sunday afternoons, yeah. And uh, but it was on basic cable, and it was pretty decent. It was you know you had um, you know ESPN, and you had USA Network right. Tuesday night fights, which was such it was it was so good, it was so healthy for boxing. And of course you had Showtime and HBO, so you had all these different television platforms. And the cool thing was it was all being played, it was all being shown. Um, eventually on all these networks. Like something would happen on TVKO and then get shown on HBO, and then a couple weeks later you'd see it on uh, the USA Network on Tuesday Night Fights. I used to watch, you know, the the pay-per-view fights that I missed, like Mercer Morrison or um, it was a real good heavyweight scrap. What was it? Uh, Michael Moore against Burt Cooper. Yeah, tremendous heavyweight slugfest that, That you know, I heard was awesome, but no one saw it. It was like a TVKO. No one saw it. (laughs) <laughs> but right. like, you know, like two weeks later, where everyone saw it on on the USA Network because USA Network was basic cable. It was in like ninety million homes, so people saw it. And promoters and networks were putting st- stuff out on VHS. So like, I'm a college student, like from eighty eight to ninety two. I'm a college student, and I'm shopping at like Walmart or Kmart or Myers out there in in, right. in, in Southern Ohio, and there'd be this big bin like this huge giant basket of like cheap videotapes and it's like everything from like mickey mouse to the three stooges to mary poppins and then like nbc's greatest fights you know what i mean and it's like uh you know it's like, you know all of ali's great fights with frazier and foreman right. and you know that kind of stuff you know i mean that's how that's how i saw uh the rematch between um sugar ray leonard and thomas hearns was i saw it on vhs I watched it like maybe a year later on VHS. I got the, the tape, and the tape included the first fight, and it included, you know, the rematch. And and you know, it was just impossible. If you, if you had any interest at all in boxing, it was almost impossible not to at least become a, a regular casual fan. And if you were more than just a casual fan, you were going to become a hardcore fan. Right. Yeah, there's a million questions I've got. I mean, it's just interesting watching how things have really grown. I mean, do you think it's it's watered down? Do you think it's... A little bit. What do you mean? Well, hey, Gabe, specifically, what do you mean? Has The, the quality of writing, I think. We had Michael oh, okay, Katz you're talking on. about the, the coverage. Um, yeah, that, that's what's a sport, but the coverage. I mean, Michael Katz said, I said, yeah. if you could change one thing, or what is lacking in the sport, and he said, well, in the sport, you know, uh, he thinks the skills are fine, but the editing is horrible. Uh, mm-hmm. Agree or, or disagree? What, what do you think is is that we've lost as as we've yeah? Lost? Well, there there are less editors. I mean, you know, we can probably between us we can name fifty boxing websites. How many of those boxing websites actually have editors? People who's <laughs> like, okay, it's my job. It's what I do to copy edit. Right. And uh, you know, and as somebody who has to do it, I mean, it's 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 difficult, especially when you have a, a huge load. Like I, I mean, I I write and I post and I do you know I put up the pictures and the videos and all this other stuff. And you know, I can get a story from you know one of our writers, and 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 some writers turn in cleaner copier than others. But depending on how much energy I have or whatever, or how many stories I've edited that day, man, stuff gets through. Stuff stuff slips through my eyes, or you know, I, you know, Ring has a has a has a uh, has a part time copy editor, Brian Hardy, who you know he's the 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 guy who basically shoots and edits and directs the next round. Yeah, and stuff. And he's a sharp dude, but I mean, you know, you get enough on your plate, stuff slips by. So I mean, it's yeah, definitely the editing is not really there. I mean, Michael Katz is coming from um, 
you know, the newspaper era. Right. He's he's newspaper generation, although he was a pioneer in, you know, a full time newspaper boxing writer going to the internet full time and he did that through through House of Boxing and then later Max Boxing. But um, you know, he always had an editor. He always had a dude whose full time job was to go through and ask questions and clean up anything that that, that might have been wrong. Oh, um, I could use just, that. You know, yeah, kind of you know, confusing <laughs> in his articles. And Coyote so, Duran is our editor. He does a good job, but I'm yeah. also not easy on an editor. You know, I'm not, yeah. like. No, I mean, you're, you're right about that. It's, it's sloppier. It's sloppier, and and I and I disagree with with. I mean, I mean, with, you know, I I think I think boxing as a sport. I think the skills are not as clean as it used to be. I don't I don't think um, you know people. We see less and less complete fighters. And yeah. I also think we see less and less complete writers. Um, you know, I think people kind of specialize in certain things. Like some guys are just going to specialize on TV ratings, or some guys are just going to specialize on just Q and A's or profiles. Or some guys are going to. You don't see a lot of guys who just do it all. Like, okay, I'm going to cover the press conference. I'm going to cover the fights. I'm going to write feature right. stories. I'm going to do deadline stories. I mean, there's a lot of guys. You know, they don't do deadline stories. You know what I mean? No, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not. The you don't see. You don't they don't see even do build writers. up stories. Yeah, you know? no, you don't see that. No, you, it's mostly. I mean, this, this is part part of the it, the internet generation and social media is like anybody can kind of comment, and that's what it is. But you know, tweeting during a fight is not journalism. You know, that's not right. covering a fight. Watching something and just saying this fight sucks. Or this guy's head looks lopsided. Anyone right. agree with me? You know, or just yeah. you know, somebody just trying to be a smart ass. Um, on, a, on a, you know, through social media, that's that's not being a that's not being a writer, you know. Right. No. But there is there's it's it's less. I mean, there's more people out there talking about boxing, but there is less substance. I I, I would say that you know that's that's I don't think that's unfair. But I, I still think it's like good that. writing though. And I, I don't like think that aspect yeah. of of the of yeah. like you're mentioning because I you know I took over your your position at Max, and I was like okay, there's a huge responsibility, and I I was a reader of yours, still am. And you, you, and and, you. and and Steve were like guys that between the two of you covered every aspect, and so I've had to learn how to cover a press conference. Uh, you know, do the the stuff Steve doesn't like to do. Do a fight report. Uh, do the <laughs> deadline. Uh, you know, all, all, I, I can I can vouch. He's actually done a few uh, deadline reviews. Not a lot, but he's done a few deadline reviews. Done a, I've actually saw him with his computer. <laughs> you don't like on, doing yeah. it. No one does. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pain no. in the ass, but yeah, he has done it. <laughs> Remember him kind of, I forget which fight it was, and he was doing deadline <laughs> because you couldn't. And I think it was, it was, he was doing deadline for a newspaper. He, he was like yeah, freelancing yeah. off of, and he was like announcing like, you know, I'm doing deadline tonight. Like, <laughs> we're all kind of looking at him like, yeah, we do this all the time. But, you know, yeah. have, have fun with that. Let me, uh, I'm going to try to call Stephen. I don't know how this, this iPhone is going to handle it. Hopefully you'll stay on the line. I want to, just for a few seconds, I know you got to go. Uh, to kind of have you guys. No, I'm just. Do. I just want to warn you. My 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 wife and my two girls are going to show up any minute now. That's right. She's just going to be dropping seconds. them off. I just need to set them up with dinner, and I could I could talk to you another half hour. I mean, I just I just got to oh, go to another great. room or whatever. There might oh. be some you know interference. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm just done like last away. time. I'm I a think dad. it's been what? what? What can I say? Yeah. Right. No, <laughs> well, no, no, I understand. I, I, I think it's been what uh, two years since you've been back on Leaving the Ring Radio, right, Dougie? When was the last time? Uh, I, I don't know. I think know. it's two it's years. I think time. it's been yeah, yeah, at least it's two years. So, you know, yeah. We did a roundtable, and I think it was for like a Manny Pacquiao uh, roundtable. I think it was finding Miguel Cotto or something like that. I, I don't even remember, man. Oh, but shoot, yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me ask you this, because I know a lot of listeners right now are listening, and they probably want to know, what was the, the, the first fight you covered that was a, an awe, where you almost forgot you were there as a media guy? I've had I've had a lot of fights like that. Um, I tell you what, the Marquez brothers—they have um, oh, they've yeah. produced that sense of awe a couple of times. I mean, there was the third fight um, between Rafael Marquez and Israel Vasquez, where I mean, going into it, people were like, "Okay, Rafael Marquez is a spent bullet." I actually picked Marquez to win that fight, and I, I was feeling like a genius going into that twelfth round, and somehow <laughs> Izzy Vasquez just summoned this superhuman. Effort and you know one of the greatest final round efforts I've ever seen, and just took the fight on my card and and you know the judges' scorecards with this amazing final round. But I mean the whole fight was so it was it was fought with such intensity and valor 
Um, but also technique and skill. It was just a, it was unbelievable. You know, I I, right. um, I mean, I didn't. I just sat there after the decision was announced, and I'm looking at my screen. I'm like, how the heck can I do this justice? Who the hell right. am I? Right, I'm right. Guy, I'm just sitting here. I can never do that. I mean, that's. I mean, it was amazing. You know, and you know, then I just. You know, I take a breath. You know, take a deep breath. I'm like, okay, all right. I'm just, I'm gonna write what I'm feeling right here, man. This <laughs> right. is, this is special. Hats off to both of these guys, you know. And uh, you know, Marquez's, uh, uh, not Rafael Marquez, but Juan Manuel Marquez's um, fight with Juan Diaz. I felt that way. I think most of press row felt that way after the first fight between Diego Corrales, the late Diego Corrales, and and Jose Luis uh, Castillo. Mm-hmm. And um, the third fight oh, what a between great fight. Um, right. uh, Marco Antonio Barrera and, and Eric uh, Morales. I remember the ring, the members of Press Row standing up and applauding. And this was still at a time when, you know, at least half of the members of Press Row were, were full-time newspaper writers. And they're like, right. You know what? These guys have given us so much. What a trilogy. What, a, what an awesome third fight. And just, you know, get up and they applauded. So it's happened more than a few times, you know. Right. Let me ask you, when did you feel that you guys were an impact in the internet for boxing, you know, from the people that were the naysayers or the guys that kind of looked at you guys kind of like, you know, this is kind of an offspring type of of, of journalism? There, You know what? And I just, just to warn you, I just, I'm looking out the window, my wife and two girls have just, oh, and of course, she's got a Pollo Loco. Unbelievable, man. <laughs> I've been cooking dinner this whole time. I've been cooking dinner for the last hour. I got my laptop, I got my I laptop on the kitchen counter. <laughs> so my laptop on the kitchen counter. I'm listening to your show. I'm listening to the entire interview with Kevin Ioli. And I'm cooking. I'm like, oh, isn't she going to be happy? Is dinner on the table set up? Oh, my God. And, of course, you got a bag of Pollo Loco. Unbelievable. Hang on a second. Now, hold on, hold on. Bear with me one question. I'm going to answer your question. All right. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, you know, I made dinner. <laughs> this <is> hilarious. <laughs> while, while he's handling his uh, his wife, uh, Brandon, can you? I'm, I'm, on the ra- I'm doing a radio thing. Can I? I'm, uh, can I go into another room while you set him up by the table? Uh, okay. Well. Yeah. Well, Doug, while you're handling that. Uh, yes. We'll bring in. We have Steve already here waiting on hold. Okay, so, uh, okay, okay. But Brent, whatever. Ask, ask that question again because I do want to answer it because it, it, okay. it, it, there's more than one. There's more than one moment where whatever I felt we made it or that we were accepted or that we had some kind of impact. And maybe Steve can can chime in as well. Right, right, girl, welcome to the yeah. show. The, uh, the what was it, the other half of uh, a, a duo for for years and years, Doug and Steve. On the next round, we all grew up watching them. Uh, Steve Kim of Max Boxing, one of the top writers in the sport. If you don't know, nobody knows. Welcome to the show, Steve. A uh, couple of things. Number one, that was just domestic bliss I heard in the Fisher household. <laughs> yeah, and, right. and number two, the Jets just selected Quentin Copels out of Carolina. So anyway, right. that's, uh, I don't want to give any draft spoilers, but uh, glad to be with you guys. It's been too long. It's been yeah. too long, brother. <laughs> Who the Rams take? I'm, I've been doing the show. Uh, the Rams picked someone that was not a wide receiver. I think Sam Bradford shed a tear alongside with you, Gabe. Oh, it didn't. <laughs> Unbelievable. I think the plan is to bring back Eric Dickerson. They're going to run the ball all day like they had Dieter Brock back in the day, you know. The Rams could screw up a sandwich, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, Steve, um, let's, get to, let's get to the boxing. The, the, the main thing we've been talking about here is the beginnings of Internet boxing, how it's changed, or boxing coverage, rather. Um, and Dave has had a really interesting question. Uh, if you want to hit Steve with that one, I think that's that's kind of, We were talking about how you guys were the, some of the first internet journalists to get credentialed. Period to, to live fights. But uh, Dave, hit him with your question. I liked it. Well, you know, my question was, um, Steve. Welcome again, brother. It's always fun to have you on. First off, you know, it's always a pleasure, man. Uh, one of my favorite writers to, to bring on the show. My my question is. When did you feel the impact? When did you feel that you guys have made a change and you've made everybody else, the naysayers and, and the people that were doubtful and kind of looked at you guys like an offspring spring of journalism? Hmm. You know, it's a very interesting question. I think it had to be, and, and I'm someone who grew up reading a newspaper. And in fact, I'm probably 
the oldest young guy to read the paper, um, the youngest old guy to still read the L.A. Times every day. That is very true. You still do that, Steve? Uh, <laughs> the entire paper? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I marvel at that. I'm like, oh, my God. He yeah. reads the whole paper. I do oh read my the whole God. paper. I do. Wow. Now, I have to admit, I start with the sport, <laughs> then I go to the calendar section, then I read the important stuff, okay? Yeah. But I start off with the dessert before I get to the dinner. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think the impact really came as the newspaper business started to close shop up, uh, shop up on boxing. I mean, we're living in a city now where Robert Morales, I think, writes the last real boxing column of any major daily. I mean, Bernard Fernandez just retired after a very illustrious career. I want to congratulate him on that. I saw him in Houston a couple of weeks ago covering Danny Garcia. He said, this is the last thing I'm doing for the Philadelphia Daily News. And I felt that was a landmark. But yeah. to answer your question, as these guys kind of faded away, uh, Ron Borges, Michael Katz, the, you know, one of our colleagues at Max Boxing, and all the old boxing writers that you knew, um, were, they're like soldiers. They faded away. Well, more and more it became an issue of, hey, are you guys going to come? Because I remember a time when me and Doug were at a fight. It was the rematch between... Lennox Lewis and Hasim Rahman, yep. and it was at the Mandalay Bay. And I remember Doug was ringside, and I was at a media seat. Uh, in fact, I was in the media room, and they had us in a press box where you had to have a telescope to see right. these two little <laughs> stick figures. I've and, been there. And it was, and I'll never forget, Joe Santaliquito of Ring Magazine and I were there, and we're at the media center, and they had a big screen where we could watch the HBO pay-per-view broadcast. And to my side, they actually had beer. And I said to Joe, I said, Joe, why are we going up there with no beer when the three Budweiser are right here at the bigger screen? And that used to happen a lot, guys, it, up until about 2003, where they would actually tell websites, whether it was us at Max Boxing or Fight News, we were probably the first established ones that could regularly get credentials and then get multiples on press row. But there used to, when we stopped hearing, me and Doug, well, you guys are just the Internet, Right. When it became, wow, now it's just the Internet covering this damn game. We better show them some respect. I think that happened right around 2002 or 2003 because I think the impact of the media as it related to boxing and the Internet, I think dovetail with the whole rise of the Internet, how the computer started to get out of your living room den to do your taxes or put your files away. When it started to become your information and entertainment portal, it dovetailed right alongside that. I think there was a direct correlation. Do you remember what uh, Gordon Absher of the Mandalay Bay said to us, Steve? A lot of he said a lot of he said a lot of circulation here, guys. A lot there of, you go. Know, he, he came up to a, that, now that, that that told you something that he, that he respected us enough to actually go up to that box and apologize and say, guys, sorry that you're up here in a in a press box. But there's a lot of circulation down there. <laughs> Not so much anymore. I mean, and you literally, know what's funny? yeah, like two years later, there, there wasn't a lot of circulation down there, even for a huge fight. Yeah, not really? a lot of circulation. The only difference is uh, we're still in, in employment. We're still making a living doing what we love. And right. we're very lucky that way. But, I mean, there was a point, Dave and Gabe, where when, especially, especially Doug. See, I've always said, I latched on to Doug and Gary Randall. I mean, these guys started it. I can go back to like 1997, 98. I'd go to these press conferences, and I'd see these two guys that I'd see at L.A. Boxing, and this is how far out of it I was. I would say to myself, oh, that's me. They have this little computer that kind of flips out. And I'd, what do you call that? It's a, lap well, a laptop. Never seen those things. I mean, I had a Commodore 20 or a VIC-20, okay? So... <laughs> <laughs> I see these guys showing Lee Samuels or whoever the PR 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 person was at the time right. what they were doing, and I, I'd be like, "What? What is that thing? That thing's not gonna last." And uh, you had to do that, by the way. You couldn't yeah. just say, "Hey, we're a website." They're like, "Well, what do you mean?" Yeah, what is you a website? Have, yeah. It was show and tell. No, you did have to do that. You know, really, but, right? You know, and, thankfully, they they were you know they were interested. And and I would see these guys, and I'd be like, "What? What? That's not going to last." And I and, and they, they were doing a thing called House of Boxing, and then they went through some changes. I was actually doing local radio. Right, I did a three hour radio show, believe it or not, in L.A. called the Main Event that was devoted nothing to. Nothing but boxing. And, in fact, Doug, that's how we met. I used to give away foreign boxing tickets because, quite frankly, there were a lot to give away. And you'd ask rudimentary <laughs> trivia questions to give them away, and Doug was always like the third guy. So if he uh, couldn't get credentials, he had the Kim Pass. 
Because Steve Kim had free tickets from John <laughs> I, 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 Rudy. Saw, I saw a lot of Chiquita Gonzalez yeah. fights and early Marquez. A lot Marquez of Julio fights. Gonzalez, a lot, lot yeah, of early lot. Juan Manuel Marquez. Absolutely. And, Cause Cause I, right cause I knew, hey, because I knew Julian Jackson or Aaron Pryor's nickname was the Hawk. You know what? I, I did <laughs> use that question twice. I did. I, 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 that was definitely a rerun question. And so then what happened was, in 2000, I'm kind of floating around. I left the radio station. I needed a gig. And I'd gotten to know these guys. And I said, hey, I said, Gary, we're driving up to his birthday party. I said, Gary, do you guys need a writer? And he goes, yeah, you want to write? And I said, uh, yeah, have you ever written before? I go, I can learn. And he said, okay, well, we'll pay you this much, and then I was on staff. And that's basically how it began. But, you know, wow. it would not be truthful for me to say that I was a pioneer. I really wasn't. I was not on uh, Christopher Columbus's ship. I may have been on, like, the third or fourth <laughs> wave uh, that hit Plymouth Rock. But it really, Christopher Columbus on the Santa Maria, uh, that was really Doug and Gary that kind of did that. Then there was a lot right. of other websites that really kind of l- launched it. Well, you know, I, I want to say I, this. I it was know. important to have you on that ship, Steve. And I remember asking you how to structure the website. Uh, it was after a, a press conference. It was like a top-ranked press conference in Beverly Hills, kind of announcing that monthly series that they had for a while. Uh, I think it was a Sunday night series uh, on Univision that was um, it, it was always at the Olympic Auditorium. And that's, you know, like, like Floyd Mayweather fought on that. Corrales did. Um, Antonio Diaz did. Lehman Brewster did. But I remember asking you, what should a boxing website have? Because I, re- I respected your opinion, and it was also very important to have you on board because you were always somebody who was following the industry uh, and was just up on news all the time, 24-7. I remember what I told you, Doug. I, I said, Doug, you know this news that's like five days old that you haven't updated yet? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, on this yeah. realm, you may want to update it a little bit more. I think yeah. that's what I told you, wasn't it? We used to update. We used to update period like maybe three times a week like literally like we would cover wow. we would cover a fight yeah we would cover a fight at forum boxing and this is crazy the story it, the website wasn't updated till like the next day and then it wouldn't be updated for like another two or three days you know it was yeah it, it wasn't it it was it was feature stories coverage mostly local coverage um, right. Rankings, schedule. I don't remember else what else we had on there. We had some, you know, uh, maybe a limited video page or whatever. Um, but um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't round the round the clock news. It wasn't updated uh, definitely on, in, in a timely fashion. But even that, I mean, shit. The the, the newspaper like the, the Sac B where I was living up there, or you know, L A was always a little bit better, but. I lived in Sacramento uh, when, before the internet began and then when it, it started. I mean, they were always so far behind, you know. Even the the Ring magazines, that was always the problem. I loved the magazine, but it was always the news was kind of uh, with the internet. I mean, even three updating just three times during a week seems like a lot better than than the newspaper. Well, yeah. I mean, at the time, the the quickest way to get um, up to date boxing news was the boxing update newsletter, the boxing update and boxing flash newsletters, and they were weeklies. They were like a right. mimeograph thing, I mean, just black and white. I mean, real cheap paper, and um, this was mailed out to you. But it, it came out every week, so it was more up to date um, than any magazine, and they covered more of the sport than the daily newspapers. So when the internet came out, it was like a little. It was a step better than that. Okay, we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll give you up to, uh, updates more than just once a week, but um, right. Very in rapid succession, it really became by by ninety nine, um, and that's when Fight News came out. It was like no, it's every not just every day, it's every hour, and that was sort of a revolutionary thing. That was almost like CNN, you know, with cable television, like really? yeah. News twenty four hours a day? Is there news twenty four hours a day? Well, you know, hell, we'll find some or we'll make some. You know, it's like that. And Doug, you're absolutely right. I mean, the evolution's come to a point with Twitter, which I love. I, I'm an unabashed Twitter holic. It's really minute by minute. Uh, mm-hmm. and, I mean, yeah. to me, Shit, I, second I, by second. Yeah, I think the ironic thing about the rise of the media presence of the internet in terms of boxing is that it was largely created by the apathy of the general papers. I mean, let's be very honest about it. If the L.A. Times and what other other papers are out there, the Long Beach uh, Examiner or the Herald Examiner, as I grew up with, when I grew up as a kid, guys, I remember reading John Bay Rudy. I, I remember reading Mike Downey or Melvin Durflag, Doug Krikorian. 
And every single writer, they'll tell you from that era, they loved boxing. That was a favorite beat of theirs. But as boxing became a beat that was about as highly thought of as women's volleyball, JV volleyball in high school, it opened the door for guys like Doug and Gary and then eventually me and everyone else because if boxing was covered like the NFL is or Major League Baseball, right. I don't think the presence would be as great, to be quite honest with you. It was an interesting thing, too, is that we, like I said to Doug earlier, was like as we've gotten to the point where we can – we can update things in a minute. And people are following, you know, your Twitter, your story, you're breaking stories constantly. Uh, Doug's feed is going all the time, mine. And yet the sport has diminished and, and in terms of people giving a shit about it, particularly, in, I think, in, in North America. I think it doesn't diminish in Mexico, and it certainly is going strong in, in Europe. Uh, but what I was asking Doug earlier is what do you think we've lost as we've gained this kind of uh, worldwide coverage that we're getting and, uh, this connectivity that we get through social media, what are the things that we've lost as, as maybe boxing writers and as a sport? Well, I think this this is like a ten-tiered question. I, I've dealt with this before, and I've written certain things on it. I'll never forget, it was me and Doug, we were at the Louis Colazzo-Shane Mosley fight. It was at Mandalay Bay, I think it was early 2007. And I remember about 40 minutes before the HBO cameras went on, there was no fights going on. And it was that classic Golden Boy hiatus that you have at every show. And it was just like this empty arena with no atmosphere. It had the uh, liveliness of a mausoleum. And I remember looking at Doug, and I said, Doug, can we still cover a major sport? It was depressing. And I remember writing a whole series called The State of the Game. And to me, boxing will not be fixed by... You know, pound for pound rankings, or you know, linear champion. That that stuff. Right. Been lost is marketing and real promoters and networks who basically enable people, and you know who they are, who take from the game and give nothing back to it. And to me, if you look at the success of the sport, and if you watch the DVDs like we do, or we go on YouTube, if you watch every other boxing community, and if you look at every other boxing marketplace across the world. Their events are successful. I'm telling you, they don't talk about the death of boxing in Germany. They don't talk about it even in Africa, where a lot of these other right. guys fight. I mean, I think the U.S., the, what happened to the downfall of boxing really began, I believe, sometime in the mid to late 80s, is that with the advent of HBO and Showtime, paying license fees, and this is where the promoters are to blame, that when they started to make a deal with the devil and started to take their product – off of ABC, CBS, and NBC, and slowly shove it onto the smallest particular platform they can find for the most amount of money, what happened was a very small amount of people actually benefited from that. It was those promoters and those 10 or 12 fighters good enough to be on those platforms. And I think that has become something that's problematic. And then as Fight City started to die because everything was being shipped off the Chumash or Agua Caliente, Think about it. Philadelphia is no longer a fight town. Right. And when a lot of these major cities that once had a regular schedule events uh, at the championship level, well, if you're a newspaper editor, if you don't host any fights and there's no local fighters to cover, guess what? They're not going to have a boxing beat. So all these things are intertwined together. And it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very complex question. I, when people say, how do we fix boxing, and some blogger puts up three things, like I'd abolish the sanctioning bodies, that stuff to me, um, again, that's mental masturbation. I don't think you're getting to the real heart of the problem. That's like having cancer and prescribing two aspirins. You're giving medicine, but you're certainly not giving a cure. You know, that's, that's I would funny. Add I, was, one thing I, was... to that, Steve. I would add one thing to that, and uh, I, I touched on it um, in the Monday mailbag. Cause somebody sent me an email saying, hey, my interest in boxing is waning. I'm, just, I'm finding it harder and harder to follow this sport, and I became a hardcore fan in 97, and I immediately thought about 97 because Oscar de la Hoya fought five times in 97, and I did just a little bit of research, you know, just like yep. literally 10 minutes on, on box rec, and I looked and I found that guys who were like the young up-and-coming fighters who were considered elite, you know, they were, they were the number one guy in their weight class, whether it was featherweight or lightweight or whatever, they were fighting between four and six times. Yep. And mm-hmm. I... Right. Fighter activity is a big part of it, because you're absolutely right that the downfall began in the mid to late 80s when boxing promoters and managers took elite fighters 
from network television and went over to, to, to HBO and Showtime where the licensing fee was bigger and the money was, you know, the payout was better. Um, but it was still boxing. I would say, you know, boxing was still healthy in the late 80s and the early 90s, even though you had big right. fights on HBO and Showtime and on TVKO and pay-per-view, um, you know, uh there was still boxing on network television at the time, and there was still a lot of boxing on basic cable. And the, the, the stuff that you missed, the, the big-time boxing that you missed that was pay-per-view or on HBO, oftentimes you'd, able, you'd be able to catch a replay a week or two later on Tuesday Night Fights on USA Network. So it was or still, ABC or CBS, right, Doug. Or AB, exactly, They would also replay right. the fights that happened, closed circuit or, or you know, um, uh, on, on, on pay-per-view. And... There was just there were more platforms. There was more dates for fighters. If they wanted to stay active, they could stay active. Because when when Shane Mosley fought five times in in, in 1998, defending his his lightweight title by knockout each time, it, it wasn't always on HBO. Right. Sometimes it was on ESPN. Well, Doug, sometimes let me, it was on USA or, or even Doug, what? You on TNT. Doug, he actually fought yeah. on uh. TNT, and yeah. that's another thing. And I've written about the fighter inactivity for years. Could you imagine if the NFL basically set up a structure where the Packers and Cowboys played four games a year or the Lakers played ten games? And what has happened is with the the overpayment of certain fighters, with the the pay structure, which is really rooted not in reality. It's not about gate receipts. It's not about television ratings. It's about if you're with Al Heyman or a certain promoter or if Kerry Davis or Stephen Espinosa likes you, even if you're fighting in a ballroom, with as many people, and I'm going to steal this from Carlos Acevedo, as many people as had a Nathan's hot dog eating contest, you're still making a million and a half dollars. So, in, in other words, guys, you've de incentivized <laughs> fighters from wanting to fight more often. It's human nature. If any of us was given the chance, guys, at whatever we do, hey, guys, you could work four times a year for X amount, or you can get that same amount of revenue in one outing. We'd all make the same decision, guys. Let's, right. let's just be very honest about yeah. it. Just saying, wait a minute, let's work for the equal amount of money? That's what we dream of. But until we get the pay scale and the revenue under control where fighters are paid appropriately to what their real value is worth, not the opinion of a TV executive who right. sometimes have an agenda that's not rooted in honesty, what Doug spoke of in his mailbag will continue to exist and, in my opinion, will continue to get worse at least in this country. Yeah, and it's hard to get fans. It's hard to pull in casual fans when the top, the guys who are considered the next wave, the next generation, are only fighting twice a year. If, they're, and if they were fighting six times a year or, or, or five or even four times a year, it would be so much better because even if it wasn't televised, you'd hear about them fighting. You'd hear yeah. their names. It would be written about somewhere. I mean, people had heard, hardcore fans, had heard about Prince Nassim Hamed before he 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 he, he had his uh, his his HBO debut against Kelly. Yeah, Kelly, Kelly, right? He was fighting, so yeah, he was fighting. You had there was some buzz created, and that buzz that buzz wasn't going to be there if he wasn't fighting multiple times a year. And and apart from just the popula- popularity of the sport, I think the fighters would be better. I think the fighters would be more. You know, they w- wouldn't take them so many rounds to to warm up. I think they'd be more comfortable. Um, and I think there would be less injuries. Guys well, would, Doug, wouldn't have to spar so damn hard and so damn much during their training camps. If right. you're fighting five times a year, you don't have to spar all of it. You don't have to spar yourself in shape if you're fighting more than, than four times a year. You know, that's why I think so many of these big fights nowadays uh, don't live up to their billing for one reason. And I think Bradley Alexander, I pointed this out before the fight. We had two fighters in Bradley Alexander which yeah. was the most important fight to save the future of boxing in the Silverdome, according to people. Uh, I pointed this out. You had one guy that fought one time the year before uh, out of his weight in Bradley. The other guy had fought twice and looked pretty bad against Kotelnik. And uh, right. what you speak of is that there's no groove. There's no momentum. There's no timing. And, and people say, well, wait a minute, Steve. You want these guys to fight eight times a year? That's so dangerous. And they're taking all these shots. Hey, guys, let me tell you something. When you fight twice a year and you go through two eight-week camps, right, where you're not only cutting 40 pounds, because that's what they do nowadays, their fat <laughs> camps, they also say, boy, we had a great camp. We sparked 200 rounds. So basically you went through basically 10 fights for free and you're getting hit. I, I would right. rather have you fight more often and not spar. I remember Freddie Roach telling exactly. me in 1979 he fought 10 or 11 times. He said halfway through the year 
He didn't, A, have to cut weight, and he never had to spar. His timing was intact the whole year. Because and, of that activity. Absolutely. And, and those punches you take in sparring count just as much. They do just as much damage, damage as the punches right. you take in a real fight. And if you're fighting six or eight times a year, people aren't going to expect all six or eight of those fights to be against fellow elite opponents. When right. you're fighting, when you're an active fighter like that, like, like Julio Cesar Chavez was, you take those, in between those pay per view bouts or those HBO or Showtime showcases, he's back at Kulia Khan or whatever, and he's, he's, he's fighting uh, just a guy. And if you, you know, look at the, 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 the record of Hall of Fame fighters like Sugar Ray Robinson, okay, right. in between a Jake LaMotta and a Randy Turpin, he's just fighting some dudes, man. And they, were, they were solid guys, but he wasn't fighting world beaters. When he was fighting like ten and twelve times well, a year, so you don't have to. It doesn't. You don't have to kill yourself. God, we wouldn't, we we wouldn't have the uh, the outraged fan either, oh. uh, if, well, if because the guys fight so little, it becomes you know. Uh, there's a right. There's more attention on them. Of course, yeah. Yeah. guys. There's more attention. There's more expectation. Guys, I said this last year when Sergio Martinez and Lou DiBella were like unpromoting their way into like uh, to the abyss of nothingness. <laughs> I, I love I love the, I love this thing that they were saying both of them and especially Lou who I've had my battles with I like Lou but Lou yeah. kept saying last year as they faced Darren Barker yeah that Darren Barker right and he said well we need a break a break why well we faced all these tough guys and I wrote let me just say something we're <laughs> fighting once every six months guys do you know what your break is. Those four months in between, you're not doing a damn thing. <laughs> See, right, right. <laughs> That's your break. It's like it's like that school kid first week of a, um first week in September. Come on, teacher. I don't want homework. We need we need kind of a break. Yeah, you know what your break was. It was called the summer. Okay. Right. <laughs> hey, my my right. the, the break is with my kids. You know, they pick up one uh, p- uh, piece of clothing off the floor and then they go, "I need a break after this." You know. <laughs> yeah. Your break is that we pay your rent, we feed. You and I'm going to Shut buy you a cheap card 18 now. Shut up and pick up the rest of your underwear. <laughs> Just real quick, uh, this has been great, guys. I, I could just we could just keep you forever. But uh, fight picks. What do you think? What are you looking forward to this weekend? It doesn't have to be the big fight, but if you could pick one fight that you absolutely have to see, what is it? Uh, Doug, you go ahead. Uh, You've got the I think I'm probably more I'm I'm more interested in watching Ismail Salak fight on Friday Night Fights than I am yeah. the uh, Bernard Hopkins Chad Dawson. I mean, to me, he's a more promising fighter. Um, he's somebody who's been underexposed, and and he's he's also been a modern fighter who doesn't fight as much as he should fight, as much as a fighter um, of his talent and his caliber would have been fighting, um, you know, two decades ago. Um, so it, it's special when he, when he gets a showcase, a televised showcase. I want to watch him because he's he's one of these um, sort of you know these prospects that I've been high on for a few years now, um, and in, in the, you know the Hopkins Dawson fight, I mean you know there's some real animosity there. I'm kind of hoping it does translate into some action in the ring. I'm not hopeful of that. I don't think it, it's going to happen. I mean just style wise, um, it doesn't figure to be a, a barn burner. But um, you know I'm I'm thinking age might finally catch up with. Uh, yeah, see, I'm I'm done. I'm, it's time I get off the phone because these ones. Are <laughs> hey, I'm still on the phone here. I was I was saying something good. I don't even remember what I was saying now. No, but I'm, 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 I'm saying yes. Give me give me give me a minute, sweetie. Uh, I'm 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 thinking that I'm I'm liking I'm liking Dawson in this fight. I'm liking him by by decision. Um, Doug, you know, I'm not saying I, I'm, not, I'm not saying Bernard's gonna embarrass himself. Although he did embarrass himself, uh, I think you know. Last October, but I, I, you know, he's going to be difficult. He's motivated. He's got a lot of pride, and I do think Bernard is an all-time great fighter. Um, he won't go quietly, but um, I, I do favor Chad Dawson by decision in this fight. Sounds uh, like Doug needs some boys you. in the house too. Yeah, <laughs> no, son. no, I'm, I'm done. I'm retired <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with kids. Yeah, <laughs> girls. Um, Doug, I agree with you. I like Dawson, and I'll be in Pomona, so I'll be DVRing that. That's how much I care about that fight. <laughs> oh, you're gonna be you're gonna be watching Chocolatito. Yes, yeah, I am. Juan Gonzalez. Yeah. Um, you know, it's actually, but but I will say this, and I've said this before, and our website leads the country in Seth Mitchell stories this week. It's amazing. We've had like 18 <laughs> Seth Mitchell. So <laughs> Wait, that is a hot. I'm thinking to myself, something really wrong with this. Steve, 
That that is an upset because uh, Lim Satterfield writes for RingTV.com, and I thought that Lim Satterfield was Seth Mitchell's publicist. <laughs> I, thought, I thought we would I I thought we would beat you guys on Seth Mitchell's stories, but uh, evidently not. But that, that, been a okay. Has there been a strange? In all seriousness, I'm I'm looking I'm looking forward to the the Mitchell Witherspoon fight. I actually think that's going to be a decent scrap. I think Chad Witherspoon, if he can survive the first three four rounds unscathed, which he did not against Ariola, because I thought he fought a horrible fight. Right. I, I, I listen. I like Seth. I've probably written more words uh, on Seth Mitchell uh, for someone who's not named Lemuel Satterfield and is not from D.C. <laughs> and I like Seth a lot because, quite frankly, yeah. if we need a heavyweight, let this guy be the guy. He's very marketable. Absolutely. There's a promotability to him. But he still has those football muscles. And right. we have not seen him swim in deep waters. Now, the Sultan of Bragama fight was a positive first step. But I'll say one thing about Chaz. Chaz is a tall, lean guy. He's got some height to him. He's got an educated left hand. He's going to be in the best shape of his life. Been working out there with Virgil Hunter, which adds to his boxing IQ by about 50 to 75 points. I think if he gets out of those first three, four rounds relatively unscathed, we do not know how Seth Mitchell is going to react to a real prize fight. Because, guys, we know this. A lot of this early success is based on facing guys who are handpicked by matchmakers. Right. I just want to see what happens in rounds six, seven, and eight. As Chad Witherspoon kind of figures out that, you know what, this guy's more fatigued than I am. I think that, to me, is the fight of the night. You know, and they've gotten, they've gotten him some good, some good sparring partners, too, for, for, uh, for Chad. So I, I think that's going to be the telling as well. They've been, they've been getting some guys out there that have that kind of similar style. Uh, I wouldn't say, he's, you know, Seth Mitchell's reckless. But you can kind of tell that some of those punches, there's no balance to them, and they're kind of over the top. So uh, um, I, I'm really interested in this fight. I, I think uh, I think the workout with Virgil Hunter and the spar partners Virgil Hunter has picked is going to do a lot of telling in this fight on Saturday night. I'm picking Witherspoon, but I, uh, you know, I would feel a lot better about my pick if they had two camps with Virgil Hunter, and he's also working with, with Victor Conte and Remy Korchemny up there. But I really like what I heard from, from Witherspoon, and I agree with Steven. If he makes, makes it through those first four rounds, five rounds, uh, it's anybody's fight. Uh, but, guys, this has been um, fantastic, uh, a little mini reunion of the next round and uh, really bringing home our whole theme tonight. I, I thank you both. Uh, Doug, I, I know you've got uh, children to, to feed. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Doug, fight. there's good news, you though. You're going to have chicken leftovers for the next three days. You're good for <laughs> <laughs> My my cooking didn't go to waste. I mean, your side orders might get a little foggy if you don't eat it tonight, but you're good for the next couple of days. You can get a protein up, man. That's very true. Uh, Steve, bright side Kim, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. Absolutely, guys. Um, you know, I'm glad you guys are doing Hey, by the way, guys, I'm going to make a bold prediction. This week's show box will be better than last week's. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. It was more like old box last week. Uh yeah, hopefully. Uh, and we got Fortuna. That's a great fight with Yondell Evans. Uh, that's another one. It's going to be a good weekend to fight. There's just well, that Gabe, thing. Gabe and Dave, I got some news here. I tweeted it out earlier. It looks like either July 7th or August 11th on Showtime is going to be the Jean Pascal Tavores cloud fight, which I think is a fun fight between two right. flawed guys. Yeah. And I think the deficiencies of both men make that a good fight. I'm also hearing that Adonis Stevenson might be on the card, and the name they're, they're bringing up is one of my old favorites is Glenn Johnson. So uh, that wow. should be a fun night wherever that takes place in that's Quebec or Montreal. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that is. that's a good card. <laughs> but hold on, but, 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 but that news is not official until Dan Rayfield breaks it next week. Okay. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I had to get that in there, guys. <laughs> that is fantastic. Oh, well, gentlemen, man. thank you. Pleasure as always, and uh, Steve will we'll be heading out to promote it. I'll see you Saturday, brother. <laughs> and Dave, stay well. And Doug, I'll see you soon, man. All right, all right Dave, take it easy. Right, hey, thanks, you. guys. See you. Later. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> but there you have it. Doug <laughs> Fisher from Ring TV Magazine, and uh, Steve <laughs> Steve Kim from Max Boxing here on Leaving the Ring. It was fun. I got to tell you, man, um, you know, me and, uh, me and Gabriel had talked about doing this segment a while back, and uh, the timing was perfect. Um, you know, I thought, I, I just, you know, we wanted to do something a little bit different here on Leaving the Ring. Normally, we'll have fighters, and we'll interview them, but we wanted to have, we wanted to give the people, the, the boxing writers' internet experience 
of it, of the beginning and uh, a chance too to hear these guys' personalities when uh, because most of you guys read their columns, uh, but you had a chance to really hear uh, their thought on the fly and see how sharp they are and why they they honestly make the big difference in our sport of boxing. Yeah, it was nice to it's nice to just kind of look back and see where you come from, in a sense, you know, and get a history of you guys. I met them, um, and I didn't want to, you know, make it about me while we were uh, while they were on because it's it was about them and and, and what they've done for our sport. But right. Those the first two riders I met on the beat, you know, Caesar's Palace. Uh, it was like the Fight Hotel, and that's where we were drinking uh, the first like they have a Friday and Saturday night of the first fight I ever covered in Vegas, and they were just as warm and welcoming and telling stories, and you just wanted to sit there and listen and go. You know, I guess this is the business I'm entering into. You know, here I am, like almost six, seven years later, and you know, it's just uh, they're just hilarious. They're just great guys on the beat, and I think it's nice to kind of humanize them because you know, fight fans are like you know, like uh, Kevin said, people get brave on the internet and they'll yell at them, "Oh, you're biased," and Steve, you know, you're you're rude, you block everybody. And Kevin, you know, you're Kevin, and and for a chance to just kind of hear those guys tell their stories and what they bring to our sport. I thought it was kind of special. I really, I, it was everything I hoped it would be. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I don't know if the, the the listeners enjoyed it. I hope they did. I'm pretty sure they did. You know, it's really a chance to have a glimpse of uh, how things were started and how it uh, got us to this point. You know, uh, sure. uh, come up. You know, I mean. I know that there. <laughs> I can tell right now. I know there's some uh, website o- owners to bloggers, uh, or even uh, guys that are writing on the beat right now that have heard some things and been like, "Well, wait a minute. What do you mean? What do you mean about this and that?" But um, if you kind of just, if you're open-minded, you can kind of more or less hear that the advice that they were giving of becoming a professional and respectable journalist in boxing. Like anything, I think in life, whether it's you know wanting to be an actor or a plumber or a boxing writer or a radio host, no one can want it more than you. You've got to do it. You've got to be all about it. Be very passionate about it, which you've got to think about when you wake up and go to sleep, you know? I think that's – and you've got to follow the rules. This isn't – I know you get close to these people, and it's a, diff, it's a weird sport because it is so personal. It's a one-on-one thing, and you go to the gym, and you're around these people. And, you know, I, I've let myself probably get too close at my boxing gym, you know, at times. Uh, you know, I actually have a trainer, you know, that, that works in the industry, but it also gives me a different insight. I think there's many different ways you can do this job. But right. Integrity is something that you carry with you wherever you go, integrity and objectivity, you know, and, and as long as you, you kind of set the rules with people that we're going to be friends, we're going to get to know each other, but I'm always going to be dead honest with you, I think you should be fine. But the bottom line is the work ethic. You've got to write. you got to write all the time. Yep, you got to write and you got to do your research and you got to take your you, you got to look at at all the angles and um and just go for it. You know, I mean, we got some some really good young writers on leaving the ring and you know and and the communication is one of the biggest thing uh you know, and I've gone through my mill of of writers, you know, that just want to have their way and do what they feel that is necessary because all they want is the credential. But, you know, we got a small team, and, a, and I think it's a, g- a great little team because it's a team that's still still learning. And that's why I say, you know, um, even my team right now, they know they're not yet there, but they're working hard at it to get there. Uh, even leaving the ring radio, our company itself, we're very small, very young, and we're trying to get there, trying to get to that Get to that place, man. Hey, let's uh, let's pass in some fight fans here that want to talk boxing here on Leaving the Ring. If you want to call in, 347-215-7598. If you missed Kevin Ioli from Yahoo Sports and Dougie Fisher from Ring TV and uh, Steve Kim from Max Boxing, don't worry about it. You can catch it immediately after we're off live here on Leaving the Ring. Catch the replay of uh, our show. And if you haven't tuned in, if you're Spanish-speaking, Latino, you want to support Noche de Boxeo. Every Monday night, 5 o'clock Pacific Time, 8 o'clock Eastern Time.